If you've been a fan of A Song of Ice and Fire for a considerable amount of time, you know that this fandom has theories. A lot of theories. Theories that range from the plausible and well-evidenced to the absurd might as well be fan fiction tinfoil. These theories, the good and the ill, have been carefully collected and arranged here in the form of a theory iceberg for our own entertainment. For this video, I'll be giving my thoughts and things on all these theories, the ones that I believe in and the ones that I don't, as well as the ones that should be taken out back and given the gift of mercy. With that being said, let's get into it. The A Song of Ice and Fire Theory Iceberg. Level 1. The Good Place. R plus L equals J. R plus L equals J is the theory that states Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark are the parents of Jon Snow and that he is their true-born son. This makes Jon a Targaryen and an heir to the Iron Throne. The idea is that Rhaegar didn't kidnap Lyanna as it was first reported. In truth, they were mutually attracted to one another. Their bad romance began during the tourney of Harrenhal, where Rhaegar crowned Lyanna as his queen of love and beauty, the day the smiles died. They would meet again sometime later when Rhaegar chanced upon Lyanna as she was traveling through the Riverlands. The two then decided to run away together. They were wed on the Isle of Faces before a heart tree, according to Northern Wedding Rites. Maybe the wedding was officiated by one of the green men that stand sentinel upon the Isle. Lyanna would be Rhaegar's second wife, but there is a precedent for Targaryens practicing polygamy after all. I don't want to hear otherwise. <laughs> Lyanna would remain in the Tower of Joy during Robert's Rebellion, where she would give birth. Ned Stark would find her later lying in her bed of blood, her and her son. Lyanna would plead with Ned to protect her son from the rage of Robert Baratheon, who has come to despise all Targaryens, despite being one himself just a little bit. Ned would accept her promise, choosing to name the boy John after his mentor, John Aaron, and to claim him as his own bastard son to hide his true identity. This would place John at the head of the current line of Targaryen succession, above Daenerys. I'm not counting Young Griff because I don't think he is a Targaryen. I think he's a false and a phony. You're a phony! Hey! Do I believe in the theory? Yes. R plus L equals J is one of the oldest theories in the A Song of Ice and Fire community, if not the oldest. People were discussing this on old message boards way back in the 90s after the publication of the very first book. For many, it's the gateway drug that leads to all the other theories. But here's the funny thing. A lot of people will tell you it was obvious from the moment they picked up the first book, while others will read all five of the published novels and will not pick up on it at all. Some readers have expressed dislike for the theory, calling it cliche. The hidden air is a well-worn trope in the fantasy genre. Critics of the theory express dismay at the idea of the series ending with John being crowned king, Marion Daenerys being a dragon rider, essentially the standard safe high fantasy ending. I'll admit I'm not a I'm not a big fan of that idea either. <laughs> but if R plus L equals J is true, then it would be the hidden air trope as done by George R. R. Martin. Instead of being apprehensive, try to be cautiously optimistic with what Martin might have in store. He has surprised us before in interesting and soul-crushing ways. He definitely has it in him to do it again, if he finishes the books. There are several alternatives to R plus L equals J. Some are interesting theories, others appear to be contrarian theories that exist because people don't like R plus L equals J. But a strong dislike of a theory isn't the best basis for an alternative theory, and there has yet to be an alternative theory that can rival the original. When you come for the king, you best not miss. And a lot of you are missing. Sir Robert Strong is the mountain. Sir Robert is the newest member of the Kingsguard, replacing Eros Olcart, who died down in Dorne. Sir Robert is a giant mountain of a man, broad and tall, with armor that's more like stone than metal. He never removes his helmet for reasons unknown. Perhaps it's against his religion. He does not eat nor does he drink, and he has sworn a vow of silence until such a time as the king's enemies are all dead. Because of his size and the fact that he seems to be hiding his identity, there is a theory that Sir Robert is actually Sir Gregor Clegane, who is supposed to be dead as hell. Clegane was mortally wounded during trial by combat with Oberyn Martell, his body given over to Kyburn for care. Kyburn has been performing a lot of graphic experiments in the black cells. It's alive, it's alive. It's alive. 
It is possible he managed to reanimate Sir Gregor. Do I believe in this theory? Yes, it's quite obvious to the reader and the characters as well. What do I think is under his helmet? Something horrible and gross. Specifics aren't really necessary. The bigger question here is, why did Sir Kevin let Cersei pick the next Kingsguard member? Like, Cersei is in jail for a reason. She makes nothing but bad decisions. When she said, the time has come, I would have been like, yeah, you're right. The time has come for me to leave. You fucked my son, your cousin, and visiting hours are over. Jon Snow will be resurrected. Towards the end of A Dance with Dragons, Jon Snow is betrayed by his fellow brothers of the Night's Watch. After declaring war on the Boltons and gathering men to lead an attack south on Winterfell, Jon is stabbed multiple times and left for dead in the snow. Throughout the book, Jon alienates himself from his friends and his peers, makes political enemies with his wise but unpopular decisions, generally making himself to be the prime target of an assassination attempt. His fate is left ambiguous. Is he dead? If so, will he return? Yes, I believe that Jon will come back in some form. It can't be a coincidence the Red Priestess Melisandre was introduced as a POV character at the Wall in the same book where Jon is supposedly murdered. Red Priest? can raise the dead. Melisandre will replace Jon as our eyes and ears at the wall until she has time to resurrect him. We just have to hope Jon doesn't lose too much of his personality in the process. A lot of people think Jon will come back evil because that's what happened to Catelyn Stark becoming Lady Stoneheart. But Catelyn was already like that. Her heart had slowly been turning to stone for multiple books. She had been like that. She can't blame her resurrection for her new murderous personality. Remember when she got a piece of Theon's skin in the mail? The Hound is the Gravedigger. In A Storm of Swords, the Hound was wounded in a fight, and it seemed as though he might die. Arya left him for dead before departing for Salt Fans. Salt Fans. Arya went to Salt Pans to find a ship. She left the Hound without medical help. It seems she left him for dead. But in A Feast for Crows, when Brienne Podrick and Septon Maribald visit a religious retreat known as the Quiet Isle, they find in the stables Stranger, the Hound's horse. He has been renamed Driftwood. In the Lichyard, they pass by a large hooded man digging a grave. The man walks with a limp, the result of a poorly healed wound, perhaps. Septon Maribald's dog takes an interest in him. Because of his size, his limp, and affinity with the dog, named Dog, readers have theorized the gravedigger is the hound. Do I believe in this theory? Well, yes. Like with Sir Robert Strong and the mountain, it's very obvious that the gravedigger is the hound and that the hound is the gravedigger. His horse being in the stable seals it. Brienne is later told that the Hound is dead, but as a Star Wars fan, Brienne is told the Hound is dead in the same way Luke is told his father is dead, which is to say the man he used to be is no longer with us. He has become something else. In the Hound's case, that's a good thing. For Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader is actually a pasty, pudgy, bald man. He looks like he got space suds. This is like when Dream took off his mask for the first time. Nobody wants to see that. <laughs> Alaris equals Sorella. Alaris, a novice at the Citadel, is one of several characters introduced in the prologue of A Feast for Crows. He is half Summer Islander, half Dornish, with a widow's peak in his hair. Alaris is popular for his wit, his archery skills, and his high level of and his high level of intellect. For this, he is called the Sphinx. This theory states that Alaris is not actually who they claim to be. The boy Alaris is actually the girl Sorella, a bastard daughter of Oberyn Martell, one of the Sand Snakes. Sorella has been masquerading as a male novice for reasons unknown. Perhaps she is following in her father's footsteps. Oberyn studied at the Citadel for a short period of time, earning a few links of a maester's chain before leaving in search of other interests. Oberyn was also known for taking great risk and pushing boundaries, something Sorella is doing here, training at this all-male institution. Alaris's identity isn't a difficult mystery to solve. Oberyn Martell has a widow's peak, as do all of his other daughters. Sorella is said to be half-summer islander, just like Alaris. 
Also, Alaris is just Sorella spelled backwards, so there's that. And Tegrin spelled backward is Nurgit. <laughs> That's all, folks. John is Rob's heir. By the middle of A Storm of Swords, it would appear that the only Stark children alive are Rob and Sansa. Bran and Rickon are reported killed by Theon Greyjoy. Arya's whereabouts are unknown, so the worst has been assumed. This leaves Rob with a dilemma. Until he sires a son, he needs to designate someone as his heir. Sansa is his heir by default, being his last remaining sibling. But she is married to Tyrion, making her, on paper, Sansa Lannister. Rob can't risk his birthright going to the Lannisters. So Rob considers naming Jon his heir. He will offer the Night's Watch rewards if they let Jon break his vows. This horrifies Catelyn, who has always feared Jon would try to steal her son's birthright. Rob makes his decision, but his choice is never shared with the audience. It is placed into a letter which is sent north with an escort. The theory is that Rob did in fact choose Jon as his heir. Do I believe in it? Sure. I mean, I guess? Oh. I, I admit I don't really care. Because as we already know, Bran, Rickon, and Arya are still alive. So does it matter what Rob wrote? I'm not so much interested in who he named as heir. What I am interested in is any other details that might have been included in the will. Like what are the specifics of the will? There might have been other details that might surprise us. Catelyn always feared John would ruin the succession, but what if Rob does just that by naming a random relative over John? Speaking of Catelyn, how come she stops thinking about the will after Rob has made his decision? You'd think that if Rob named John his heir, she would be stressed out about that, or relieved if he didn't. The will stops being important in her mind the moment Rob makes his decision. Of course, that's because Martin doesn't want to give us the answer, showing us a minor flaw of the limited perspective he uses, because Catelyn, by rights, should think about Rob's decision after he makes it. She doesn't. Level 2. As good as it gets. The Manderleys will betray the Boltons. This is an odd entry. To say the Manderleys will betray the Boltons is to suggest the two houses are allies. We know that House Manderley despises House Frey. We know Wyman is actively conspiring against the phrase. If that's the case, it should be expected that the Manderleys will eventually turn their wrath on the Boltons as well. So this isn't really a theory. This is something that's actually happening. Secretly feeding someone human meat in a pie should be considered a betrayal. I know it was the last time I did it. N plus A equals J. The first, but I'm sure not the last, of the R plus L equal J alternatives on this iceberg. This is a theory that states Ned and Ashara are the parents of Jon Snow. It is rumored Ned and Ashara were romantically interested in one another during the tourney of Harrenhal. Uglier rumors say Ashara was dishonored by a man during the tourney. This man could have been a Stark. Ned is usually named as the One. One reason given for why Ashara Dane died by suicide is that she lost a child, either in childbirth or because the baby was taken from her. So based on the timeline, it would seem Ashara and Ned met at the tourney, had an affair, Ashara got pregnant, and that child would grow to be Jon Snow. Except, one thing the first book stresses is that Ned Stark was a man of honor. This is reiterated again and again. It is not likely Ned, a man of honor, would have left Ashara with a bastard in her belly. Bad theory. I don't believe in it. Orain is the Lord of the Waters. Orain Waters, also known as the Bastard of Driftmark, is a member of House Valarion. He comes to serve on Cersei's council as her Admiral of Ships in a Feast for Crows. He petitions her to build three large ships called Drummonds to augment his fleet. When Cersei is arrested, Orain disappears from King's Landing, taking his newly built ships with him. In an Arion sample chapter from Winds, she is told tale of a pirate king called the Lord of Waters, who has three huge ships at his disposal. So, is this pirate king Orain Waters? Signs indicate yes, the Lord of Waters has three huge ships just like Orain received. Just like the Sorella Alaris mystery, this one seems easy enough to put together. Lemongate. 
One of Daenerys Targaryen's fondest memories comes from her childhood when she and Viserys lived in a house with a red door. Danny distinctly remembers there was a lemon tree outside of her bedroom window. But the house with the red door was in Braavos, and it is notoriously difficult for trees to grow in Braavos. Lemon trees grow in very warm climates, and Braavos has colder weather. So, how could Danny live in a house with a lemon tree if it's almost impossible for that type of tree to grow in Braavos? If she was wrong about the tree, what could that mean about the rest of her childhood? That is the gist of the Lemon Gate theory. Do I believe in it? Well, Martin has implied there are things about Daenerys' past that will be revealed in the future, which makes sense. Characters in this story can be unreliable narrators. I would not be surprised if there was no lemon tree or the house with the red door was in a different location like Tyrosh. But where I draw the line is when Danny's questionable memories are used to question her entire existence. No, I don't personally believe the Daenerys Targaryen we know is an imposter. She is not a fraud cooked up by Viserys and Illyrio. She is the true-born daughter of Aerys and Rhaella, the sister of Rhaegar and Viserys. Like, come on, every other character is a hidden Targaryen, right? Jon is a Targaryen, Cersei and Jaime are Targaryens, Tyrion is a Targaryen, Varys and Young Griff are Blackfires. But the one character introduced as Daenerys Targaryen, the one who hatched dragons and has dragon dreams, she's not a Targaryen? So you mean to tell me everyone in this picture is a Targaryen, but her? Lyanna was the Knight of the Laughing Tree. During the tourney at Harrenhal, a mysterious knight entered the list. They wore mitched match armor. Painted on their breastplate was a smiling weirwood tree. This gained them the nickname, the Knight of the Laughing Tree. The knight unhorsed several men whose squires had previously been caught bullying a Krenogman. Because of this and their unusual appearance, people sought to know the name of the knight. Mad Aerys considered the knight a potential threat and sent Prince Rhaegar and other men to find them, but the knight was never found. Some theorized the knight was Lyanna Stark. The Cranogman was Howland Reed, a friend of House Stark. Lyanna and her brothers defended Reed from the bullying squires. Lyanna was known to be an excellent writer and she practiced at swordplay with her brother Benjen. But does that mean she would have the skill to win multiple joust? Possible but it seems unlikely. I admit, I don't know if I believe Lyanna was the knight. I also don't really care much. It's uh. not a mystery that I find all that intriguing. The Smiling Knight mystery doesn't seem to have any bearing on any major plot developments going forward. If she was the knight, this might be how she and Rhaegar first met. Cool, but that's a detail that doesn't really pique my interest. Night Lamp Theory as of A Dance with Dragons, Stannis and his army have taken up residence in a crofter's village somewhere near Winterfell. The village sits between two frozen rivers. The Night Lamp theory states that Stannis will use this terrain to his advantage. He will have holes cut into the lakes and then lure the Frey and Bolton forces over them so they will fall through and hopefully drown. There is a more detailed version of the theory which I won't get into. The very basics of the theory, however, Stannis using the lakes to his advantage seems very plausible. As I've mentioned in a previous video, this is a tactic Prince Joshua in Memory, Sorrow and Thorn used to defeat his enemies. Martin has borrowed heavily from that series, so it is indeed possible he will have Stannis do the same. Oberyn poisoned Tywin. Immediately after Tywin Lannister is killed at the end of A Storm of Swords, his body begins to emit an awful stench. One might attribute this to the fact that he was killed while having a bowel movement, but even after his corpse is cleaned up for his viewing, his remains continue to reek. Cersei wonders if the body has been tampered with to embarrass Lord Tywin in one final act of disrespect, maybe Pycelle on orders of the Tyrells. However, it could be the cause for the smell was introduced before Tywin died, which is why the Oberyn poison Tywin theory exists. It is theorized that Oberyn slipped Tywin a poison called Widow's Blood. The symptoms of this poison shuts down the bladder and bowels of the consumer until they die of their own poisons. After killing Shay in Tywin's bed, Tyrion knows exactly where to find his father, in the privy. And how would he know that? Well, 
During a previous conversation, Oberyn told Tyrion his father would not live forever. Oberyn is well known for poisoning his enemies. Tyrion is a smart man and could have put two and two together. But do I believe in the theory? Well, no and yes. I admit I like this theory. It adds a nice complexity to the tale without going overboard as other theories tend to do. There is evidence supported by the text, which is very solid. During Tyrion's trial by combat, Pycelle introduces a series of poisons, one of which is called Widow's Whale. No, that's, that's, a, that's a sword. Such a great sword should have a name. What shall I call her? Widow's Whale! Widow's Whale, I like that. You're gonna die tonight. <laughs> Elia was Rhaegar's widow, so Oberyn using the poison against Tywin would be fitting. And I like that there are sometimes characters plotting and scheming things that overlap or conflict with the plots and schemes of other characters. Schemes and plots are the same thing. Oberyn could have never guessed Tyrion would have killed his own father, which would make his scheme to poison Tywin invalid. The only drawback is that Oberyn Martell didn't expect to die during the trial by combat. So if Lord Tywin Lannister died of poison not so long after Joffrey died of poison, Oberyn would look mighty suspicious. Suspicious. I think he could be arrested just based on the suspicion. Besides, Oberyn seems to prefer poisoning his victims during combat. It's hard to imagine him slipping Tywin a poison and letting it do all the work. Level 3, The Good Fight. Fagon is a Blackfire. Fagon is the nickname given to the character of Young Griff. I don't really like using it because to me it sounds too close to another word and I'm trying to stay monetized. Oh, what's he say? Queen. Young Griff is the name of a teenager introduced in A Dance with the Dragons. He claims to be Aegon Targaryen, son of Rhaegar. But is he truly Rhaegar's lost heir or does he have a more sinister identity? Yeah, I did a whole series of videos on this. You can watch the mega theory here. And you know what? I'm going to re-record the audio for this one. I know the poll voted no, don't do it, but I'm sorry. I cringe when I think of it. It keeps me up at night. I'm disregarding the poll. I recognize the council has made a decision, but given that it's a stupid ass decision, I've elected to ignore it. Do I think he's a Blackfire? Yes, of the female line. Does he have to be? No. It's perfectly fine if he's just some random kid with Valyrian features, but he's definitely not the real Aegon Targaryen. Tyrion was the real target of the Purple Wedding. What? Littlefinger has all but confirmed that Olena Tyrell poisoned Joffrey to protect Marjorie, but that's not a satisfying answer for some readers. It is suggested Tyrion was the target all along. But why? How? All the evidence points to Olena Tyrell with Littlefinger being one of her co-conspirators. I do not believe in this theory. It should not be a thing. Mance wrote the pink letter. After Theon kidnaps the fake Arya, Jane Poole, they are taken to Stannis' camp where they now remain. Ramsay Snow, who forcefully wed Jane Poole, sends a letter full of terrible news and violent threats to the wall. The letter is sealed with pink wax, which is how this theory got its name. But because of some alleged inconsistencies with this letter when compared to Ramsey's other writings, some readers wonder if he wrote it at all. If not him, then who? There's a theory that Mance wrote the letter to Lord Jon Snow South. The letter uses the word crow to refer to the members of the Night's Watch, which is something wildlings are known to do. Mance is at Winterfell using the alias Abel the Bard, but the pink letter said Ramsay captured Mance. So how does that work? So as the theory goes, that was all part of the lie to Lord John South to make John feel desperate, under pressure, so that he would do something rash. Do I believe the theory? No. The pink letter was never a mystery to me. I always assumed it was Ramsay. It's kind of like the Quentin is alive thing, which we'll get to, don't worry. It never presented to me as a mystery. And if Mance did write it, what does that mean? Did he write it behind Ramsey's back? Is he working with Ramsey or pretending to work with Ramsey? I just don't see how he would have the capabilities of writing this letter and sending it out. And I truly just don't get the purpose other than to have a wow, what a twist moment. Doesn't make sense plot wise. It doesn't make sense for the characters for this to happen. 
Now that John is incapacitated, this supposed lure didn't entirely work. Danny will go mad. After season 8, this one doesn't need much explaining. And everywhere the dragons danced, the people died. I wonder what that means. All I can offer is my answer. Do I think Daenerys will go mad? Yes, though I don't think she will turn into her father. I think she's going to have a break more like Viserys, and she's going to lash out in the end just like he did. Except Viserys was weak and a fool, and no one cares if someone weak lashes out. It's more sad and pathetic than scary. Daenerys has dragons, so her break is going to be a lot more devastating. Why did Viserys break? Because he wanted to be king, and he couldn't stand it that his relative, Daenerys, got to be a queen first and receive all this love and attention, adoration he desperately desired. Why will Danny break? Because she wants to be queen, and she won't be able to stand it when she learns her relative, Aegon, got to be king first. He gets to receive all the love and attention, adoration Danny has come to be used to and to expect, adoration she desperately desires. But if you think I'm wrong and Dan and David are wrong and Daenerys is a hero and she will always be a hero and she would never harm an innocent person ever, cool. And everywhere the dragons danced, the people died. What could this mean? Moving on. Tyrion Targaryen. Tyrion Targaryen is the theory that Tyrion is not the true-born son of Tywin and Joanna Lannister, but the bastard son of Joanna with Aerys Targaryen. The theory is inappropriately named as Tyrion would be a hill if he was a bastard and not a Targaryen, but whatever. Aerys was... <clears throat> Aerys was deeply infatuated with Joanna during her lifetime. It was said that during the betting set of... <sighs> It was said during the betting celebration, the night she wed Tywin, Aerys took certain liberties with the newly wed bride. Aerys is also suspected of fathering Jaime and Cersei, but the world book thankfully puts that theory to rest. Joanna was nowhere near Aerys when she conceived Jaime and Cersei. Unfortunately, the world book fuels the Tyrion Targaryen theory by placing Aerys in Lannister lands during the time Joanna became pregnant with Tyrion. So... Is it possible? Yes. Do I believe in it? Kind of. Do I hate it? 100%. Tyrion is an author insert. He is George R.R. R. Martin inserting himself into the story. That's why I think Tyrion has so many impossible adventures, fights and battles with no experience, sits on the Iron Throne, meets all the coolest of characters. He's Martin enjoying his own world. It's fine. Most fantasy authors do this. I'm probably going to do this. Who cares? But I think this is also why Tyrion is not just a Lannister, but a Targaryen as well. He gets to be part of the two coolest families. I don't think this ruins his dynamic with Tywin like most people do. Tywin would still be his father, just like Ned is still Jon's father. Tyrion would still be a Kinslayer, as he and Tywin would still be related through Joanna. Sure, it gives Tywin a right to be upset with raising another man's child, but he would still be wrong for hating Tyrion for something Tyrion wasn't responsible for. And Tyrion can't help being born who he is, and Martin maybe should dial it back because Tyrion has a tiny toe stepping into Gary Stew territory. Sweet Robin is Littlefinger's son. Sweet Robin is the affectionate nickname given to that little shit, Robert Aaron the only surviving child of Lysa Tully and John Aaron. Or is he? Lysa and Littlefinger were engaged in a long-term affair. Could it be that Petire Baelish fathered Robert Aaron during their many years he and Lysa were at court? No, I don't think so. I don't believe in this theory. It is certainly possible, but Lysa doesn't say that Robert is Petire's. She says he is John Aaron's son. I think if she believed Sweet Robin was Petire's son, she would have confessed during her mad rant before she was killed. I think Sweet Robin being so sickly is because of his father's age and perhaps because of the damage the Moon Tea did to Lysa. Level 4. Stranger Things. Quentin is alive. No. The Grand Northern Conspiracy. 
There are many variations of this theory, but all of them share the same conclusion, that the Northern Lords are conspiring against the Freys and the Boltons, and to a greater extent, House Lannister, to restore House Stark to its former glory, either as kings in the North or wardens once again. How this is achieved depends on which version of the theory you believe in. I believe one version of the theory says this goes all the way back to Rickard Karstark and his Southern Comforts. Can we bring you anything to eat or drink? I wish we had some wine for you. It's a bit early in the day for us. Oh, now that's how you clear a bitch. I don't know who that hoe is. His Southern ambitions. Do I believe in the GNC? For the most part, no. Yes, Wyman Manderley has confessed he is looking to empower Rickon Stark, and Barbara Dustin has no love for the Freys or Boltons. The Mountain Clans are supporting Stannis, but mostly because they hate the Freys and Boltons as well. So yes, there are Northern conspiracies at work, but I do not believe they are as grand as the Grand Northern Conspiracy would have us believe. A plus J equals J plus C. The time has come to discuss Aerys' other alleged children. This is yet another equation which relates to the secret parentage of certain characters. This equation means Aerys and Joanna are the parents of Jaime and Cersei. As stated before, Aerys and Joanna were not in close proximity during the conception of the twins. One reason this theory exists is that Cersei has a lot in common with Aerys. This leads some readers to believe that is because Aerys is her father. Characters can have parallels without being related. Characters don't always need to have special parents or come from royal bloodlines. You are a palpiting. Yeah! What the fuck? Speaking of Star Wars, do y'all know how insufferable House of the Dragon fans are on social media? And I'm talking mostly about you Targaryen stands, Targ Nation. You know, the people that have Rhaenyra or Daenerys as their avatar. And they have screen names like Rhaenyra Targaryen's lawyer, Daenerys Targaryen's publicist, Daemon Targaryen's PR department. Do y'all make up these fake jobs because y'all don't have real ones? And these people are the worst because they love all the bad changes the show made to the source material. They love that prophecy, which is very dumb and makes no sense because it makes House Targaryen out to be the heroes, the main characters. They love those magic blades. They love the special bloodline. That there's one family, one name that matters more than all the rest. They love the idea of a chosen one. That there's one singular hero that is meant to save the day. They love the idea that Aegon came to Westeros to bring balance to the Seven Kingdoms. These people want Game of Thrones to be Star Wars. Just go watch Star Wars! Mormont's Raven is being skin changed. Mormont's pet Raven, which Small Paul is fond of, may be more than meets the eye. There are times that suggest the Raven is being used as a host by a skin changer. Do I believe this theory is true? 100%. Ravens and crows are highly intelligent creatures, but Mormont's Raven is exceptionally so. There's one quote from the books that feels like confirmation and it comes from A Feast for Crows. Quote, John Solar was back beyond the racks of spears and shields. He was reading a parchment when Sam entered. Lord Commander Mormont's raven was on his shoulder, peering down as if it were reading too. But when the bird spied Sam, it spread its wings and flapped toward him crying, corn, corn. End quote. HS equals HR. Everyone wants to come up with the next great equation. Everyone's got a gimmick now. What? This one meaning the High Sparrow or High Septon is Howlin' Reed. This is all part of some odd overwrought conspiracy to put Jon Snow on the Iron Throne. Do I believe in it? <laughs> Moving on. The Faceless Men caused the doom. At the House of Black and White in Bravos, where Arya trains to become a faceless man, she is given a brief history of the organization from the Kindly Man, one of her instructors. He tells her the first faceless man was once an enslaved man toiling in the Valyrian mines. He would hear the other slaves bemoaning their wretched fate, doomed to die in the mines as slaves. So he gave them their freedom with the gift of death as well as their masters. 
the first faceless man caused the doom, either by killing the mages that controlled the Valyrian volcanoes or by some other method. Do I believe in it? Not entirely. Oh. There is truth in the story of their origins, but lies as well. That's how the Faceless Men are training Arya to separate truths from lies. I also think the Faceless Men are a cult. Their teachings don't align with their practices. I would not be surprised if they had delusions of grandeur, an overinflated sense of importance. Level 5. Rescue Me. The Dornish Master Plan. Doran Martell is one of the more misunderstood characters in the series. Many believe his actions don't align with his goals. That is, when Doran chooses to act. One major criticism he faces from characters within the story, as well as from readers, is that he doesn't do enough. However, theorist Preston Jacobs proposes the idea that Doran is actually the central figure in a vast conspiracy ranging from Westeros all the way into Essos. According to Preston, Doran is working with many key figures, including Miri Mazdor, Illyrio, and the Brave Companions to achieve his heart's desire, which has little to do with fire and blood. He wants to bring down the Lannisters, the High Septon, and he wants his daughter Ariane on the Iron Throne, because according to Dornish law, Ariane is the rightful queen of Westeros. This and much, much more makes up the Dornish master plan. Now, do I believe in the theory? I do not. One thing the books tells us about Doran Martell is that yes, he does want vengeance and justice for Elia and her two children, and yes, he does want war with House Lannister, but he does not want these things at the expense of many innocent lives. Doran is not a bloodthirsty man which means it is incredibly unlikely he would have the Brave Companions, aka the Bloody Mummers, working for him, which is part of the Dornish master plan that the Bloody Mummers are secretly working for Doran. The Brave Companions are a nasty piece of work, a Selsor group made up of some of the worst people you could ever imagine. They have no honor or loyalty, and during the War of Five Kings, they commit many terrible war crimes. Anyway, the Brave Companions are just really, really awful people. Meanwhile, Doran locks up the Sand Snakes out of fear they will cause chaos after the death of their father. He doesn't want them causing any senseless slaughter, which is exactly what the Brave Companions love to do. I know it's easier for Doran to distance himself from the Companions, which he can't do with the Sand Snakes, but I don't think it's in his nature to align himself with such loathsome individuals. Doran likes to watch the children play in the water gardens. <sighs> that theory. Anyway, child, these are children that he believes must be protected because they are innocent. Septon Ut, a member of the Companions, and murders little boys. So yeah, the Brave Companions do not work for Dorne, and they are not working on behalf of Dorne. They are working for Tywin Lannister. Tywin is the type of lord that doesn't give a fig about innocent lives during war. He doesn't care if women, men, or even children are and murdered. All Tywin cares about is winning. There are other aspects of the theory that don't work for me either, like Miri Mazdor also working for Dorne. How would Doran know that Drogo's Kalasar would attack Miri's village? How would he know she wouldn't be killed in the attack? Remember, it was two Kalasars that attacked Miri's village. She could have died before even meeting Danny. A lot of the theory is based on Doran planning chance events that would be impossible for him to arrange for. He would have to be omnipotent and omnipresent. He would also have to be really, really lucky. Doran's endgame being ruinous restoration doesn't really work either. Doran never lost anything in the Targaryen conquest. If Doran has a grand master plan to enforce ruinous rule on Westeros, that's not restoration. That's imperialism. Calling that restoration would be like calling Aegon's conquest Valyrian restoration. So yeah, I could go on, but I'll leave it at that. The part about the Brave Companions working for Doran is really what hurts this theory for me. Doran isn't that kind of guy. But who knows, I could be wrong about everything. The Grand Maester Conspiracy This is a grand conspiracy about the Maesters. This is not a conspiracy about the Grand Maester. You know what, I think this one needs a new title. 
in A Feast for Crows, Samuel Tarley makes a perilous journey to reach the Citadel in Old Town so that he can one day forge his chain and serve the Night's Watch as a maester. Once he arrives, he meets Marwyn the Mage, an archmaester with a sinister reputation. Marwyn hints that the maesters are involved in a grand conspiracy, which includes ending magic. Quote, Marwyn smiled a ghastly smile, the juice of the sour leaf running red between his teeth. Who do you think killed all the dragons the last time around? Gallant dragon slayers armed with swords? He spat. The world the Citadel is building has no place in it for sorcery or prophecy or glass candle, much less dragons. Ask yourself why Aemon Targaryen was allowed to waste his life upon the wall when by rights he should have been raised to Archmaester. His blood was why. He could not be trusted no more than I can. End quote. Do I believe the maesters are up to something? Yes, Martin has confirmed this. Do I believe in the theory? Not entirely. For example, when Marwyn says, who do you think killed all the dragons the last time around? Well, it was the Targaryens. In their selfish civil war, they fought dragon to dragon and the dragons totally lost. Also, there was the storming of the dragon pit, a really ridiculous event that Martin I think cooked up as an excuse to kill a bunch of dragons. Now do I think the maesters conspired to kill off the surviving dragons? Now that I can't believe. Loris isn't really injured. In Feast, the Ironborn, led by Euron Greyjoy, begin to harass the Shield Islands. The Lords of the Shields are bannermen to House Tyrell, so this causes Loris and Marjorie a lot of distress. Cersei refuses to send aid because she hates House Tyrell for no real reason. She just, she just does. As an excuse, Cersei says the Iron Throne's aquatic power is too busy at Dragonstone dealing with Stannis' token guard. If the Tyrells are so worried, maybe they can gather up some fishing boats, some ferries, maybe some rowboats, and fight back with that. When Loras asks what are they supposed to do against the Ironborn with that ragtag fleet, Cersei says, drown. Oh, I'm serious. <laughs> so, <you're> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, it's, I love her chapters, I really do. Anyway, Loras declares he will go to Dragonstone and finish the job there so that the throne's ships can go to the shields. Cersei accepts his offer, hoping he will die in the attempt. Later, she is told by Orain Waters that Loras was hit by a couple of arrows and had ribs broken by a blow from a mace. Ironic considering that his father, never mind. Then, Loris led the charge by a curtain wall where he was covered in boiling oil. Loris survived this attack but is on the verge of death. But, since we haven't seen Loris since this incident, it begs the question, was Loris really injured? I think yes, yes he was injured. Jamie's pride was his sword hand, his immaculate ability is what he was known for. Jamie's hand was cut off. Loris is also known for his skill at arms, but we are told by Oberyn that he was forced into being a warrior by Mace, his father. It could be Loris's true pride is something else, like his looks, which he is also known for. The burns would damage that, teaching him a similar lesson in humility like Jaime. And since history repeats itself in this world, Loris might be this generation's version of the Hound. I think he was injured, but the extent of his injuries are exaggerated. This gives Loris time to conspire outside of court. Cersei can't demand him to come back to court if he's injured. And if Loris happens to show up at court not as damaged as reported, he can say it was a lie he cooked up to confuse his enemies, which wouldn't actually be a lie, would it? Frey Pie. I'm not even gonna hold y'all. Wyman did that shit. Mance equals Rhaegar. George R.R. R. Martin confirmed Rhaegar was cremated. <laughs> Jaime is the Volonquar. When Cersei was young, she was told by a fortune teller called Maggie the Frog that she would be queen one day. However, there will come a time when a younger, more beautiful queen will cast her down and take all she holds dear. Cersei's three children will wear golden shrouds and after her tears have drowned her, the Valonquar will wrap his hands around her throat and choke the life from her. Valonquar means little brother in Valyrian. Cersei believes that Tyrion will be the one to kill her. She has lived in fear of the prophecy her whole life. 
but it could be that Jamie is the Valen Carr. He is also her little brother. They might be twins, but Cersei was born first. Jamie loves Cersei deeply, more than she loves him, but in the latest novels, that love has turned sour. He found out she's been cheating on him with several other men. Their cousin Lancel, Osmond Kettleblack. Say the line, Bart. And even Moonboy for all I know. Yeah! Jamie might be making personal changes for the better, but the arrogant, angry knight hasn't completely left him. It could be that later, when Jamie and Cersei are reunited, something might cause him to snap and strangle Cersei. He has killed mad monarchs before. Quaith equals Shiara Seastar. Level 6. Lost. Sansa is Littlefinger's daughter. How? Euron is a fraud. This has been debunked by Martin himself. He has confirmed Euron went to Valyria. I don't know about magic, but there are people who have gone to Valyria. And, you know, one of them is pretty present in the book. Yeah. Uh, Euron with his, uh, yeah. with his horn. So, there you go. Jon will marry Sansa. I don't know, maybe. It'd be weird, but they are cousins, and that's legal in Westeros. He does like redheads, so yeah. Better hope Lady Stoneheart is dead before it happens, though. Jojen Paste. As part of Bran's training to become a green seer, the Children of the Forest offer him a paste made out of weirwood seeds. Bran thinks the paste is thick and white, and it looks like it has blood in it. Bran believes the red veins are just weirwood sap, but the look of it still makes him ill. To make matters worse, during this part of the story, Bran's friend Jojen grows more and more despondent. He has always hinted he knows the day he's going to die, so it appears that day is drawing nearer. His sister Mira becomes more and more upset with her brother's odd behavior. She doesn't want him to die, but she knows she can't save him either. His green dreams never lie. So, did the children take Jojen and turn him into a paste? Maybe? Oh. This all happens in book 5, and there's a lot of cannibalism in book 5, which lends some credence to the theory. The entrails of the condemned used to be festooned into the branches of weirwoods in times past. There's Yig, the demon tree, a tree with bark pale as bone that is said to have feasted on humans. Bran has a vision of a man having his throat slit and the blood soaks into the root of a heart tree. Because Bran is viewing this all from within a weirwood, he can taste the blood through the roots. The weirwoods seem to like blood. Blood magic is definitely a thing in this series, so it is possible. I just wonder if it's necessary. Like, does Jojen have to die for them to make the pace? Because the theory is the children killed Jojen in order to make the paste. But if all they need is blood, they don't have to kill him to get that. We've all seen that moment in TV shows and movies where a character slices their palm to give up some blood. All they have to do is cut Jojen and they would have an endless supply of blood. Until he dies, but still. When you pour milk for a bowl of cereal, you don't stab the jug, do you? Unless they needed a specific part of him, like his heart or his brain, then I can't see why they would have to kill him. But then again, maybe they need to kill Jojen and use his body parts in some weird Children of the Forest ritual. Is Jojen in the paste? Maybe. I think it's more likely Jojen dies in the hold the door moment and he wasn't sacrificed to make soup. Theon is the hooded man. I don't think so. I did a video on this. You should watch it. Euron was the student of Bloodraven. So, there's a line from A Feast for Crows where Euron tells Victorion this story and he's like, when I was a boy, I dreamt I could fly and perhaps we can fly all of us and how else will we ever know unless we leap from some tall tower? This little statement from Euron sounds a lot like Bran's story from the first book, which has led some people to think that Euron might have his own history with the Three-Eyed Crow. The broader theory states that Bloodraven visited Euron as a child, but realized Euron was a bad person or would grow up to be a bad person, so he dropped Euron as a student to find someone else. Now, do I believe this theory? No. I have a lot of problems with it. First off, this will sound nitpicky, but to become a student of Bloodraven, you must go to the cave where he is with the children of the forest. 
Bloodraven and Bran's teacher-student relationship doesn't begin until Bran arrives in the cave. The tower dream where Bran falls was specific to Bran because he was thrown from a tower. Why would this be a test he gave Euron when Euron never fell from a tower that we know of? The part about Bloodraven visiting Euron and finding him to be too evil doesn't work either. We're supposed to believe Euron is mad at Bloodraven for abandoning him, but Bloodraven was visiting Bran for years before finally revealing himself in his crow form. Bloodraven said he saw Bran's birth. He was there for Bran's first step. He was part of Bran's first dream. All of this long before the fly or die coma dream. So Bloodraven wouldn't have to show Euron any dreams or visions to get the measure of him. He could just visit his dreams without Euron knowing, realize, wow, this kid really sucks, and leave. He wouldn't have to learn through some failed apprenticeship. This is too Star Wars even for me. I don't think the Three-Eyed Crow has spent all these years searching for the right one to develop into his successor. I think he knew for a very long time it must be Bran. Level 7, Ryan Bergara. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. Euron equals Dario. These are two different people that exist on two different continents. I want to introduce you people to the concepts of space and time. Fast travel doesn't exist in this world. And when the characters on the show were fast traveling, y'all were upset. Y'all were mad. Now it's in a theory. This would never work. Bolt on. Bolt on, applied directly to the trash. The mountain is actually a nice guy. Who said that? Who said that? Who said that? Who said that? Level eight, American Horror Stories. Cersei killed Joffrey. Why would she do that? Y'all just be saying anything. A Song of Ice and Fire is part of the Lovecraft universe. Well, that would make it fan fiction, and Martin doesn't write fan fiction. Varys is a merman. I don't know where, I don't know how. But I know this bullshit needs to stop right now. Varys is a merman. I'm so sick of this place. Ugh. Westeros is in a hollow earth. What's wrong with that? Nothing at all. Nothing's wrong with it. So? No, I'm saying what now? I mean, it's not specifically. Tyrion is a time traveling fetus. Aren't we all? John plus Arya. John and Arya were supposed to be a couple in the original outline of the series, but Martin decided to take that out. Um, I would hope it would, be, it would be because it's a bad idea, but the incest, it stayed. And then he dialed it up to like 11. There's just so much incest now. Uncommon. Sure, whatever. At this point, whatever. He will come back from the dead and strangle Cersei. He's the Valonqar. Ned is a pigeon. Did, did Arya eat him? Bran will r Mira through Hodor. This is this is all a Song of Ice and Fire theories. It's either a person is a secret Targaryen or someone is going to be horribly assaulted. Your imaginations, y'all just be saying anything. Tyrion will sleep with Penny, who is his daughter. Anything, anything. Blood Raven will steal Bran's body. Well, what is he waiting for? Is he afraid that if he tries and fails, Bran is gonna run away? You need to leave. Cersei will Tommen. Understand this, y'all are going to jail, period. period. Tywin is the dusky woman. Now that I've read this, now that this is something in my head that I have pictured and imagined, what do I do now? What do I do with this? What do I do now, Brian? What 
What do I do? John is his own father. He time traveled to have sex with Liana, his own mother. This is Back to the Future. This is that one episode of Futurama. We're not even trying to be original. We're just whatever. Who cares? Come with me if you want to live. I'm so tired. Fagon is Varys and Illyrio's son. This could be true. The Winds of Winter will be released before Christmas 2021. The Winds of Winter coming out. <laughs> it's just a theory, a game theory. <laughs> Could you imagine that? <laughs> the Winds of Winter coming out. <laughs> Martin finishing the book. 